Okay, now, now I get to talk about one of my great intellectual heroes, Albert Otto Hirschman. He's not just a hero because his middle name was the same as my beloved grandfather, Otto, obviously of uh, German parentage, um, but also because uh, Albert Hirschman was a very rare combination of things. He was brilliant, cosmopolitan, kind, generous, always looking to solve the problems of those in a position more vulnerable than himself, and also extraordinarily brave. Uh, he was born into a very uh, wealthy Jewish family in Berlin, very well-educated, cosmopolitan, uh, secular, and like so many young and older German intellectuals, they were persecuted, uh, faced the prospect of, of later on um, literally uh, being slaughtered by the Nazi regime. Now, early on, Albert Hirschman discerned the political risks with the rise of Nazism in Germany. And he had gone to study in France at the Sorbonne, doing a doctorate there in economics. Uh, he volunteered to go and fight in the Spanish Civil War, and he did for a time. Of course, the Republican forces were defeated, and then the fascist Franco came to power, backed by Nazi Germany. Later on, when France was occupied by German forces after the fall of France, he was very active in helping to organize an escape route for Jewish and other intellectuals who were targeted by the Nazi regime. And some very prominent uh, post-war intellectuals such as Hannah Arendt were very much in his debt uh, for organizing that. Uh, people like Walter Benjamin, unfortunately, although he was helping, succumbed to the, uh, the tyranny that they were trying to escape from. In Walter Benjamin's case, he committed suicide just before he crossed the borders to, from, Spain, from France to Spain. So these early years for Hirschman were a very formative period. He understood fundamental issues of loyalty, of what it meant to be loyal to a cause, to a nation, and the tragedy that could befall people where nations did not live up to the best version of themselves. He, of course, uh, fled his, the country of his birth. He was given no choice. He, he exited, ultimately, as it turned out, in a timely way, and he worked with the Americans during World War II which inevitably must have felt quite conflicted for him, um, having been German born and raised, and yet finding himself in conflict with the, uh, the German Nazi regime. So one of his really prominent intellectual contributions, and there were many much later after World War II, is the theoretical framework encapsulated in the, the title of the short uh, but very well written book, uh, Exit Voice and Loyalty. It's a hugely influential book. Uh, I just want to introduce the concepts to this class uh, fairly concisely, but because they're so relevant to so many aspects of life. One of Hirschman's great contributions is his ability through very deep thinking to discover universal phenomena reduce them to a description that is widely understandable and widely applicable and embraced by many people. So his framework, although he started off looking at uh, economics and particularly declining performance of organizations, has been extended to so many different uh, domains. Indeed, we can apply the exit voice and loyalty framework to our key relationships in our daily rely, daily lives, literally with our, our partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, with the clubs that we might be members of, uh, with, of course, the um, companies that we go to work for, uh, or maybe buy shares in as a small-time investor. So what is this framework? Well, first of all, I want to say that it's, it's a very tight package. 
that it doesn't explain some phenomena, it explains all phenomena. So in a sense, it is a closed analytical system, but a thoroughly persuasive one. So he was interested in this basic question of how do people respond to decline in performance, performance by organizations, performance by friends, performance by the clubs that you're a member in. But he was particularly focused on organizations because he was an economist and also advising particularly developing countries on policy settings. So he realized that most organizations succumb to decline for some of the th reasons we've been talking about, hierarchical costs, silo effects, uh, principal agent problems. There are so many things at work. Organizations become less responsive over time. Just like we tend to take our partners, our friends for granted uh, over time. And he was very interested to understand why, despite this, actually more organizations didn't fail. And so this became an interesting, expl interesting explanatory challenge. Under what conditions do organizations, like organizations, uh, like relationships, like, like clubs and whatnot, fix themselves? And under what conditions are they prompted to fix themselves? And so he sees this framework of exit, loyce and, exit voice and loyalty as coming down to these three choices that every individual face, faces when confronted by declining performance. Exit is, I've had enough of this, I'm off, I'm leaving, I'm, I'm out of here, packing your stuff and moving out um, of the love nest. Or selling the shares in a company, or quitting, that's it, I quit, I'm done, I'm out of here, and just... Leaving, leaving work and never coming back again. Okay, it, it could be any of these factors. So you simply leave. In Hirschman's case, he had an acute sense of migration, of dissatisfaction with a political system, feeling that you can't live with it, either literally in his case, because he was Jewish, he was endangered by it, but many other intellectuals who were not Jewish philosophically could not abide, for example, the Nazi regime, so they decided to migrate. So to exit the nation when you feel you can't make a difference. Voice is to choose to stay, to not exit, but to speak up, to try and nudge the organization, nudge the society, maybe nudge your partner um, towards a better direction, to encourage remediation, to, to try and change the dynamic in a positive way. The third option is the kind of residual option. It closes the circle, as it were. That's why this makes um, for a comprehensive analysis. This is loyalty. Loyalty is not so interesting to us. Um, it's when individuals don't have the incentives to do either to speak up or to leave. And so they simply put up with it. Um, this does remind me of the Kyoji case sometimes at uh, Waseda. All organizations have these tendencies. Lots of people are like, ah, oh, you demo, you demo koranai, demo yaminai, demarudei. Okay, so in all organizations, a lot of people are just kind of put up with it. Okay, and many of you second year students, uh, for example, who are already in a sakura, or maybe in your high school experience, first year students know um, in Bukatsu, sometimes it's just easier to keep your dissatisfaction to yourself and of course quitting is too extreme. Now, we shouldn't dismiss loyalty as just an undesirable residual because actually uh, this gives a lot of stability to society. If everyone just quit all the time or complained all the time, we would either have constant destabilization, we would have the collapse of organizations, of companies, it would be very disruptive. And of course, if everything gets argued all the time, it's tiring and nothing gets done. You don't want to be one of those people, you, by the way. You want, to, you want to pick your fights. You know, there are some people who are arguing the toss all the time. So you don't want to be that. But you also don't want to be one of these people who never speaks up. Because organizations, societies, do need people who exercise voice. Because without those people, organizations, communities, clubs, relationships 
don't get better. Now the really significant thing, my computer just went to sleep. My, the really significant thing, not my really significant thing, it, I wish I'd thought of this, but uh, it takes Hirschman's intellect. The really significant thing from Hirschman is that he recognized the critical independency of these. Voice is much more effective when exit uh, is a possibility. You're more likely to listen to a grumpy customer if they have an alternative. If there are two coffee shops next to each other and a customer's dissatisfied, they can credibly go next door, you're more likely to pay attention to their complaints. If you're a big monopolist, you're the only provider of the, the telephone service, the customers can be grumpy, and you go, eh, eh. tell your mother she might care, we don't care, you've got no choice, okay? So really for voice to be effective, exit has to be credible. We understand it's quite clear from data in a number of societies, particularly in the United States, with the liberalization of divorce laws, which happened state by state, we can see some very interesting phenomena happened. As divorce became easier, more couples went to counseling. Suddenly a bunch of guys whose wives were going to leave them, for example, suddenly thought, mm, well, yeah, maybe I better start listening because she might run away and that wouldn't be a good thing. So you have more credibility there. By the way, US statistics also showed that where divorce was slow in being liberalized, murder rates were higher. And it was generally because women were more likely to kill their husbands if they couldn't leave them. So guys, uh, the exit option is not just a good discipline upon you, it may actually save your life, okay? So there is nothing more dangerous than someone who is extremely dissatisfied cannot effectively raise voice and has no exit option. They often feel like they have nothing to lose. They either resign themselves to their fate and become loyal, or they throw bombs or knife you or whatever, okay? So this balance of the three is important. Now the exit voice and loyalty framework can help us to explain both business and politics. And Hirschman here made another very interesting point that he said in the case of business, and especially when markets are competitive, when there are lots of firms competing, we're likely to see much more exit. People will just sell the shares and buy shares in another company. People will stop buying one product, they'll buy another product. In the political context, it's extremely unlikely that you will migrate because of your dissatisfaction over relatively minor issues. Of course, if a regime is so odious and threatening your own well-being, as Nazi Germany did to Hirschman and his family, and indeed the um, Mussolini fascist regime in Italy killed his brother-in-law, who's married to an Italian academic, and his brother-in-law, who's also one of his best friends, was, was murdered by the Mussolini, Mussolini regime in prison, um, which he never forgave. So in those extreme circumstances, you may exit your country, you migrate. But for general low-level satisfaction, then exit is not very credible, not very, very viable. That's why, of course, politics has long been focused on voice, freedom of expression the right to demonstrate, for example. All of these issues are chiefly political concerns. Now, the advantage of voice is we know not just that people are dissatisfied, but we know why they're dissatisfied. They tell us, often in intense detail, very angrily, in our face. Um, companies that are very short-sighted would just love to get rid of such people. They'd prefer they exit, I'll just go away. Go, 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 go. There's the door, use it, go. I can't be bothered listening to you. Um, some relationships end up like this. But it's very, very dangerous because you, if you just encourage people to exit, you'll never know the sources of dissatisfaction. And insofar as that there were genuine concerns, genuine issues with yourself or your organizational performance, you deny yourself that information. And so when we focus on the business side, 
where exit is much more common. The customers just don't come back or they sell the shares and they buy shares in another company. What is really scary is you don't know why. Uh, a whole novel was written by the uh, British novelist Graham Greene called The End of the Affair about a guy dealing with the fact that he doesn't know why his lover dumped him. As it turned out, I'm not going to give away the story, but in The End of the Affair, she, she had an interesting reason for dumping him. Uh, but he uh, simply is traumatised, uh, not so much by being dumped, although that was painful. It's not knowing why he was dumped, why, the, why she ended the relationship, uh, drives him to uh, the brink of despair. And it's one of the most influential post-war novels out of, out of Britain. So companies that have an interest in improving themselves really need to go out of the way to get more information about why customers don't come back. Now, this is actually rather difficult. It's difficult when someone has left to ask them why you're leaving. Uh, in American companies now, and increasingly in European companies, uh, the exit interview is being conducted by the HR department, the Human Resources Department. They interview employees as to the reasons for the leaving. Now, we tend to think of interviews by HR departments as entirely about people coming into the organisation, and that's what they have been. But what they were finding in so many big companies is that they're often losing their best employees. And remember, the best employees have the best opportunities to leave because other people want good employees. So there's a great danger in any organisation that you keep bringing people in, the good ones leave, the less talented ones stay, and that over time you end up with a less talented team and that leads to decline. So finding out why this downward spiral is happening is vital. One of the takeaways here, you know, if you are being dumped, uh, say to your departing beloved, or not so beloved perhaps, um, but why? Just tell me why. I get that you're leaving me, just tell me why, okay? It's, it's useful information to work on. If, you, if it's because you had really bad breath, now's the time to find that out, okay? Otherwise, you're going to keep scaring people off. Get that feedback information. So we do see some very rare circumstances where exit in politics is an option. And Hirschman himself, because he spent quite a lot of time researching and being an, a, a policy advisor in Latin America, he recognised an interesting phenomena. He recognised that in Latin America, it was quite easy for people to migrate, to simply move to the country next door, because with the exception of Brazil, all of Latin America is Spanish speaking. So you move to a neighboring country, the newspapers, the, the radio, the television are still in your native tongue. Um, even the food is often not so different, the regional variations and whatnot, but it's not a huge step. And he explicitly said that on the other hand, for Japanese or Koreans, for example, dissatisfied with your country to migrate is a huge decision. Because once you step outside the boundaries of your country, uh, you are speaking a foreign language. You're in a completely different culture. And I think many native English speakers are not so conscious of this. Uh, we can relocate even to non-English speaking countries, but because it is the lingua franca, the international language, our exit options are not as painful. Hence my sympathy with Junjapa. Once you step out of Japan, everything is, is just so much more difficult. Okay? Um, Hirschman would understand this. But Hirschman also made the point about Latin America, and it was an hypothesis, it was difficult to prove, but he suspected that one reason for the political instability, repeated coup d'etats in Latin America, was that the risks of carrying out a coup were lower there, because if it didn't work out, you could very quickly flee to, uh, to another country. Okay? Uh, it was a kind of all or nothing, but the nothing being not stuck at home and in prison or executed or whatever, but going into exile. So we, we have seen people have gone into exile in the past, particularly from, from South Korea, but uh, less common than in many other societies where the boundaries of the nation state do not bound the, ling the, uh, 
uh, the boundary of the, uh, the language community, for example. So just to reiterate, we have exit voice and loyalty. All three of these dimensions are significant and they are interdependent. So the very fact that there is the exit option strengthens the voice option. A student sakuru that has a lot of members dissatisfied need to listen to their voices or they're likely to lose those members and the whole sustainability of the sakuru will be threatened. Um, likewise, if uh, you don't credibly have an exit option, raising voice is much riskier for the very simple reason that you have to be around these people for a very, 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 very long time. I'm sure many of my Wasada colleagues are conscious of this and frankly, it's not all bad. It keeps people polite and you think, hmm, well, the retirement age at Wasada is 70. I might, might be seeing this person for the next 20 years. I better not be too rude. I better be careful about how I raise voice. So without the exit option, the voice option is qualified, but it's not always bad. The loyalty option brings the stability. If we were constantly breaking up companies, clubs and relationships and reforming them, that would be hugely costly. There would be many victims. So we want to strike an optimal balance between the three. But to go back to our starting point, and this is what Hirschman understood very well, it is natural for organizations and for relationships to go into decline. It's how do you then remediate that? How do you fix it? And he was the first to really highlight and express in beautifully simplistic language the fact that actually the are, there are these recuperative, these fixing mechanisms that are there, and that if we only are prepared to listen to voice, be alert to the, uh, the possibility of exit and to value loyalty rather than take advantage of loyalty, then organizations and relationships can renew, refresh, and uh, be resilient. And that's a pretty powerful lesson to my mind. And it goes far beyond business. And I think we can put it to, uh, to work in so many aspects of our lives. And it's kind of why he's my hero.